Hi, I'm Sunit Mittal for Heart Rhythm TV, coming live from HRX 2023 in Seattle, and I'm joined today by Dave Alberts. David, you've been a big supporter of HRX. Uh, you know, uh, you were here last year, you're here this year. Maybe start off by just telling us your general thoughts of the meeting. Well, at AliveCore, we've been very involved from the beginning in the use of digital health in arrhythmia care. And I, I, can, I think I can legitimately say we're pioneers in that area. Today, there are many other, even large companies very involved in that. And so we saw this venue with friends like Mintu Tarakia and uh, others as a perfect opportunity to bring, legitimize the whole notion of digital health as an element, a critical element in arrhythmia care, atrial fibrillation care. So uh, that's why we're here and we will continue to be supporters. Yeah, so today I wanted to spend a few minutes talking to you about AI and really how you see that empowering digital, uh, you know, cardiac care. And of course, as someone who's really vested in capturing ECG information, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an endpoint that's very well suited to discuss, uh, discussing this whole issue. So maybe you can take us a little bit about your own journey uh, uh, in this area, obviously predates uh, you know, this whole AI buzz of today. So how did you get started before AI and when did AI enter the picture uh, for you? Well, uh, AliveCore started in right about 2011 and uh, we developed, I think, uh, the first smartphone related ECG device. Uh, and later a, a smart watch related ECG device. And at first, we had very simple algorithms for heart rate and, and today what you call irregular rhythm notification. But when we finally acquired into our cloud more than a million ECGs, it got to the scale that enables the so-called deep learning, the so-called current wave of, of artificial intelligence. And so we were able to capitalize on machine learning using the data to inform us instead of rules-based, traditional ECG type analysis. And, and it dramatically improved our performance and continues to improve it. Uh, it took several years to get to a million ECGs. Today we have a million ECGs every week. So, you know, it will continue to improve because as your data increases, your ability to, to have that data inform your AI gets better and better. Yeah. So, is there no limit to where you see a plateau effect? Is like 1 million, you know, not as good as 10 million, not as good as 100 million? Are we getting incremental value uh, for training on more and more data? Well, it, you know, we have a great example today, and that's this chat GPT. So there was the introduced, you know, just last October, chat GPT. Now we're already at one generation beyond that, others coming. The first one had billions of of nodes, the next one has trillions of yeah. nodes, and, and it is supposedly getting better. I haven't seen any objective metrics. So yes, more data does help you. It's not necessarily a, a guarantee. You probably are asymptoting to some performance level that's just natural. Yeah. You know, even a, an expert like you has some performance level, you may, you're almost perfect, aren't you, Sunit? <laughs> so uh, I would say that, that we're getting better, but the leaps with even more data will probably be slower. Yeah. So anytime we think about these types of product iterations, there are three stakeholders. There's of course the company, there's the patients, they're the providers. Give me your thoughts and who is helped most uh, you know, by uh, the improvements that are emerging as the result of incorporating AI? Well, I think both. Obviously the companies would benefit if they commercialize it, but both the patients the last thing a patient wants is a false positive, uh, an anxiety producing event. And it doesn't matter whether it's a cardio device or an Apple Watch, we make mistakes. They make, everybody makes mistakes. And so that produces anxiety. Providers, they don't want false positives either. They want, they want actionable information. So you, when you receive a personal ECG from a patient, you want that to be something that's significant, that enables you, to get you some information that allows you to intervene to help that patient. So I think both those stakeholders, patients and providers, will benefit as our AI improves. Yeah. So Dave, you've seen at this meeting, there's a, a big interest in now, not only knowing whether somebody has atrial fibrillation, but this, this whole issue of prediction. 
can we predict who with AFib is going to have an adverse outcome? You know, maybe a hospitalization, you know, maybe it's, uh, are they going to respond well to some treatment, a drug or an ablation? And even in its most extreme, you know, predicting from a normal ECG who may develop atrial fibrillation in the, uh, down the road. What are your own thoughts? Like how close to reality is this? And what m more must be done, you know, before this is mainstream? Well, several people, uh, my friends, uh, your friends, Peter Noseworthy, Paul Friedman at Mayo Clinic, have shown that you can predict with some level of accuracy who in sinus rhythm will ultimately develop AFib, either in the future or in the past. The people at Geisinger have also done similar work. Others are showing that. And that makes total sense because we know that things like P wave durations, PAC frequency, are predictors of AFib. I think the power of prediction is strong. The question is, what can you do? If we predict that this person who has no symptoms and is in sinus rhythm will have AFib in the future, what do we do about it? Do we put them on a diet? Do we get them in an exercise program? Do we make sure their hypertension and their blood glucose are, are well controlled? I think the, that's the promise. And I think we just need some more proof that that promise will be realized. Yeah, fantastic, Dave. Well, Thanks for spending a few minutes with me. I mean, I think this really highlights some of the important issues that many people are thinking about that have been highlighted at this meeting. It's great to see you thinking about many of these issues. I look forward to hearing more solutions as, you know, HRX 2024, 25, and others come down the horizon. So, again, thanks for spending a few minutes with well, me today. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care.